Okay, so now it's time for the dynamic dialogue section of programming. Um, here's how this is going to go. So we have three speakers who are going to join us on stage, and they're going to come up one at a time and give very short talks. Each one of them will be on a subject that is relevant to misinformation. And I'll introduce them one by one once they get ready to speak. So you'll also notice that we've got four chairs up here. These are for our amazing provocateurs, and each one of them is remarkable and brilliant in their own right, and we are so lucky and grateful to have them here. So they're going to be up on stage during the next three talks, and then they're going to ask the speakers at the end of their talks a couple of questions, and they're going to kind of serve as like a proxy for all the people, all of us here, you know, to, to ask questions. Um, and they'll just get speakers to dig a little bit, deeper on what they've just talked about. Um, so I guess let's first bring up the provocateurs. We have Leslie Brooks, a veterinarian and American Academy for the Advancement of Science, Science and Technology Policy Fellow. We have Roger Carruth, a communications professor at Howard University with a whole lot of degrees and awards. We have DeRay McKesson, a leading voice as an advocate and activist on issues that impact people of color. And we have Sabrina McCormick. She's a public health professor, a filmmaker, and a storyteller dedicated to addressing the climate crisis through her work. Thank you, provocateurs. OK, wait. And there's another part to this. So since there's kind of so much going on in this segment, we have to be really vigilant about keeping it on time. Um, so I'm going to stay up here, kind of stand back here to keep the Q&A part moving along. Um, but all of the speakers have also been given a really strict warning that if they go over their time, there will be consequences. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to consequences. <laughs> Y'all, this is Nancy. <laughs> this is Nancy, and she is the communications director for the Division of Earth and Life Sciences here at the NAS, Earth and Life Studies. Uh, at the NAS, and she's also going to be our speaker timer for this segment. So what I would like to do is actually, I'm going to talk a minute as if I'm a speaker and I've just hit my time, and Nancy's going to show us what that might Your look like if I just kept is talking. Over. And, oh, and I, <laughs> I'm going to call it a day. I'm going to maybe talk louder I now. I to burst the <laughs> balloon, but we're taking your mic away. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you so much, Nancy. That was absolutely beautiful. And for the sake of our speakers, I hope that it is the only time that we get to hear that this afternoon. <laughs> um, OK, so now it's time for our first speaker. Um, he is a biologist, chair of the Human Rights Committee at the Academy, and the recipient of the 2008 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his introduction of green fluorescent protein as a biological marker. Let's welcome Marty Chalfie. <laughs> Hello. So we all know about the wonderful promise of science, but I want to talk a little bit at first about some of the downsides, some of the problems that scientists have faced. And many of these have been things that we've noticed as from the Committee on Human Rights, which works on behalf of social and natural scientists, uh, engineers, and health professionals all over the world. And so we've already heard a lot of information about misinformation and about disinformation. I want to add a couple of other aspects to this. One of them is the flooding of information, what's been sometimes called the infodemic, that if there's so much noise out there, it's hard to find out where the right information is. And so that flooding of information is an important aspect. The other unfortunate situation is that there are a lot of attacks, not on the science, but on the scientists and the health professionals. And we've seen a lot of examples of blame and attacks where people have been, uh, especially if governments feel that they don't like what is being said, they will arrange for them to be dismissed from their job or harassed or threatened, sometimes with death threats and in prison. And we've seen this really all over the world. We've seen a lot of this in terms of COVID-19. 
where governments to many times cover up their ineptitude at being able to protect their citizens would rather blame the health professionals and say and deny that there's anything taking place. We've seen this, for example, in Nicaragua, where a, several scientists wrote a paper talking about the ecological and social impact of building a canal through the country, which was a top priority for the government. The government didn't like this. They were dismissed from their jobs. They were harassed. They were also, eventually, the Nicaraguan Academy of Science was, uh, its legal charter was taken away from it. We've seen this in other respects. In Greece, in order for Greece to be able to get European Union funding, they had to change and have an independent statistical office to present the correct economic data. They did this and then turned around and blamed the head of that office, whose numbers were accepted. And uh, he had several lawsuits uh, against him and uh, even more severe charges, some of which had they not been thrown out in 2019, would have resulted in his actually uh, having a life sentence. And we've seen this also in health professionals who treat protesters that have been injured, where we've seen police turn on the medics because they were helping people that were injured, which is actually their job. And so, what are the sort of ways that we can sort of help solve these things? How can, what are the solutions? Well, clearly education is an important thing. Having laws that protect people are going to be important. Uh, I think it's also important for people to join together. One of the things that the Committee on Human Rights has recently done is bring together various health professional organizations to, as a united group, come and support health professionals, especially in places of conflict where they've been attacked. One slight fact that you may or may not know, there are four health facilities bombed or attacked every day in the Ukraine. Hmm. So, obviously, bringing people together and helping this. But how can, what else can we do to, to bring this together? There was a, a wonderful book by Joel Simon and Robert Mahoney called Infodemic, talking about the consequences of what happened in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. And one of the things they said is that one of the things that exacerbated it was the fact that local news organizations were not there. And there are several examples that I know of of local news organizations at various times. For example, in Senegal, the health authorities worked with local community radio stations to get information about HIV and AIDS. And Senegal had the lowest amount of AIDS of any West African country. There have been, there's a group in New York called Documented that has done very similar things to bring information to the Spanish-speaking community and now the Chinese-speaking community, both underserved communities, and gain their trust so that they could, in fact, get appropriate health information. So I think what this says is that we have to go and partner with local groups to gain, first gain their trust by listening and helping and use that to aid ourselves in the future. And my last point is there is a right to science in the De Declaration of Human Rights. We should be bringing science to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Marty, and you stuck that landing. Right? Yeah, no song. <laughs> <laughs> Provocateurs. All right, Leslie. All right, I'll question. ask a question. Um, so I'm curious, what are your thoughts to go deeper into your what you talked about um, when there are scientists and scientific communities with divergent views um, or scientific studies with different 
reported outcomes and how do you think that might contribute to the issues that you were discussing and how do we how do we go about that so part of what we do as scientists is to work through controversy to openly discuss and evaluate and compare uh, various ideas together having it, it, we don't try to get unanimity we try to get the best way that we can evaluate a situation. So when there is a difference, it, it, there, Enrico Fermi has a wonderful quote that I'm gonna mangle, but it's basically, if you do an experiment and it confirms your hypothesis, you've made a measurement. But if it doesn't confirm your hypothesis, then you've made a discovery. And there's a lot more discoveries out there to look at. So controversy is not the problem because we want to sort of get at the underpinning of that, and that's very important. Okay. Next. Yeah, oh. if you'd like to be. Well, um, I agree with everything that you said. I'm not a scientist, but I'm a communications person, and, and the idea of the demise of local media is very prevalent in this day and age, particularly with social media. And we... Um, in the media community, and in, in the press in particular, um, are the fourth pillar of government, theoretically. And I wanted to see about that relationship because you have the executive, the judicial, and the legislative, and then the press, the freedom of the press is a big part of that. And pointing out these examples, do you have a way in which the communications community could work better with the science community to articulate some of the issues that you're talking so about. So I think this is very important. It was one of the lines that I didn't actually get a chance to say in my talk. But I think what this also says, the experience with documented, the experience that I mentioned in Senegal, is that freedom of an independent press is absolutely essential to this. That we have to be able to have people that will investigate their local communities, to communicate with their local communities. It's really a two way street, and that we should be part of that communication. Absolutely agree. Thank you. Here, Sabrina. Um, so, thank you. And I really agree with what you just said that media and transparent media and um, the, the press, the freedom of the press, is a critically important, and also I think something that we've heard today and we all experience is the echo chambers that we are in watching our particular media channel um, and other people with very divergent perspectives watching, consuming something else. So I wonder what you think about entertainment as a way to transcend those echo chambers, potentially even in creating accountability and transparency around some of these persecutions that you've seen and that certainly you advocate to um, avoid. I think anything that makes uh, information available to people, if it's done in an entertaining way, if it's done in a, a way that's provocative, if it's done in a way that makes people think, that helps. And uh, you probably know that uh, the National Academies have a very strong tradition of working with media to get the science right but also don't ignore the science and use the science as a vehicle of talking about many different things and many different attitudes. So I think it's very important. I think my question, and this is a push to understand, not to challenge, I'm trying to understand the relationship between uh, the infodemic or the flooding of information that you started with and then the solutions that you offer at the end and trying to figure out, are you saying that you think a free press and a healthy scientific community addresses the flooding piece, or, or can you help us better understand I, what you think the response is to flooding? That's a wonderful question, and I don't have answers to everything. Um, just like in my science, uh, I don't have answers to anything. I, and I agree with you, that's one of the really important pieces. If there, are, if there are bad actors that want to flood the area with things, it's very hard to work with them. That's why I think there has to be protection from from people that it, we have to be able, I think one of the examples that the, the people at Documented did is they went into the, first the Spanish speaking communities in New York City and they first just listened. They learned about the backgrounds, where people came from, what were their interests, what were their concerns. Then, among other things, they 
established, they, they found at the beginning of the pandemic that there were uh, several opportunities for micro grants for essential workers. And they compiled the list so people could actually get at this material. And they presented that to the community so that that community would be able to avail itself of that. Once they had done that and other things to gain the trust by their direct interaction and listening, what they found is that people from the community came to them and said, we've heard about this, about, uh, about COVID-19 or about the vaccine. Or the, can you find us the information that we really need about this? So they built up trust first and then utilized it. But if somebody floods things, frankly, that's a real problem. And I'm not sure I have an immediate sort of answer to that. Can I ask one more? Yeah. I, I just Leslie. want you to talk more about listening, because I think this and the fun segment before it is the first time we started talking about that. And I, anything you have to say, I don't know if you have an experience where you have listened to people that maybe disagreed or didn't want to understand your science, and then just by listening to them, it helped them, you know, come around. So... Uh, you know, sometimes people think about, uh, this may be an indirect way of answering this, but uh, sometimes when people think about s science and doing this, is that it's so competitive, you shouldn't talk to people about it until you're just about ready to publish or things like that. I have found that every single time I've opened my mouth and told people about something I'm excited about, in return, I get so many ideas that I never thought of and things that have helped my science simply by being able to talk about it. So it's not that you, you shouldn't keep some things secret, but it, the open communication really helps. It helps uh, in a lab to sort of get rid of the hierarchy or apparent hierarchy and have everyone realize that they are actually all collaborators. And that really, when that works, it's absolutely wonderful. So, yes, this has happened several times in the science, but I don't think you want to hear about all the <laughs> nitty-gritty of the details right now. Thank you so much, Marty. Thank you all. So, and thank you to our provocateurs. Y'all can just toss in the questions as we go, too. I don't need to call on you. You just got this conversation rolling. Um, and we are going to bring out our, our next speaker, um, who is an astrophysicist who cares deeply about science education and civic engagement. Let's welcome Anita Krishnamurthy. <laughs> Well, hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. Gosh, the light's bright. Um, so to be honest, I had to think for a long time about what I, a research astronomer turned advocate for STEM education, and that's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, for those who don't speak that jargon, um, could, had to say about this weighty topic of truth, trust, and hope. And then it hit me. You know, education is an act of hope, right? We educate ourselves hoping that we're gaining the skills and knowledge we need to earn a living. We educate ourselves hoping that it will help us understand and better engage with the world around us and that it will help us apply that knowledge in practical ways, both in our own lives and to help the communities around us. And we have the same hope for the young people that we educate. We hope that we're equipping them to move through life with confidence and dignity. And we have a belief that education will turn us into critical thinkers who can hold pluralistic views, and, that it and we hope that it will inoculate us against misinformation and disinformation. And that's a hope. So how do we turn that hope into reality? How do we realize this potential of education? Because a speaker after speaker this morning has said, and as Marty just said, just amassing a body of knowledge is not sufficient. It's crucial, but it's insufficient. We have to learn how to apply that knowledge in different contexts. We have to see how it intersects with culture and society and values and understand that those might clash sometimes. And that we need to be prepared to continually unlearn and learn new things. 
And this ability to develop, sustain, and nurture curiosity throughout our lives so that we can respond rather than react to challenge when we face it is a muscle that has to be developed through practice, and it has to be strengthened through practice. So how can our learning ecosystem develop this? Because it has to start when we're young and be a lifelong effort. So what is reasonable to expect out of our education system, whether that's happening in school or in the after-school setting where I work or other out-of-school time programs like in museums and science centers? How can we all come together to develop these muscles and what would we call success? Because our metrics and performance indicators, so far at least, are kind of blunt cudgels, right? Because we, they're not very nuanced. And for the most part, as the saying goes, we value what we can measure because we can't always measure easily what we really want to value. So how do we change that paradigm and value education as something that supports all young people to thrive, not just to succeed academically but to and to join the workforce, but also be equipped to become informed citizens who are discerning and can engage in a participatory democracy and be advocates for themselves and be change makers when needed. There are examples of amazing organizations that are doing this kind of work, and sometimes entire countries. Finland, for example, is quite legendary for its education outcomes as well as its fight against fake news. I serve on the board of Nobel Prize Outreach that has a whole curriculum around critical thinking that we will be launching shortly. And there are many other programs that are doing this kind of work all over the world and in the United States. And it's tempting to think that we just need to pick the one good program and scale it up because that's the solution. But we all know, and we've heard this again and again, local context matters and local culture matters. So things really have to be adapted to a local community because what works in Finland is unlikely to work here. And what works in an urban environment is unlikely to work in a rural environment. And as I said, I mainly work in the after-school and out-of-school time spaces, which are rooted in local communities with local educators and youth, and recognizing that the STEM conversation has become quite transactional, even in this space. You know, you study STEM fields so that you can get a job. You offer STEM learning because you can then participate in a workforce. And don't get me wrong, jobs are important. We all need to earn a living. But it's much more than that, right? And I think that um, we, you know, it, the STEM narrative has to include STEM knowledge and ways of thinking as a tool for public good and citizenship. So with that in mind, I've launched a new initiative called the Collective for Youth Empowerment in STEM and Society, or CS. It's a project of the After School Alliance, where I work, and we're trying to bring together people and organizations who are working at this intersection of STEM, civic engagement, and teen leadership so that we can really give young people a voice and a seat at the table from the very beginning. And by forming a community of these programs, we hope to better support and empower young people to develop and apply that STEM knowledge in local contexts and to enact systemic change. There's some really amazing programs out there doing this work, and I'm really idealistic and believe that this expanded narrative will allow, them, will allow more young people to see themselves in it, allow more people to engage with science, and hopefully expand a sense of belonging for some of the minoritized groups who are often left out of science. So my hope is pinned on both the young people and the adults who are working with them to empower them, to support them, and most importantly, to act alongside them. And we hope that this approach will also enable everyone engaged in this effort to become more critical consumers of information. Because when something real is at stake that affects us and the communities we care about very deeply, we want to trust that we're acting on unbiased information and we will want to check for that. And this work, as I see it, is not optional. It's really necessary. And it fills me with hope that so many of us are trying to engage in this work. That includes me and my colleagues and all of you by participating in this conversation. And I hope you'll join us in this work. So thank you. Thank you, Anita.
provocateurs. I'll let you take it away. I'll go. Um, so thank you so much. And I, I'm very excited to hear about your new collective, your initiative. I'm especially excited to hear about it because uh, I work in the climate space. And obviously, we all know about this incredible climate anxiety that youth have now. And what we see in our research is that something that stems that is action, Absolutely. actually engaging with political systems, social systems, friends, neighbors, whomever. So I would love to hear how you're thinking about that, if there's a way you see that your program will address that or even just move in that direction. Absolutely. Um, so as I said, we're not trying to launch new programs. We're trying to support existing programs that are doing this kind of work so that we can expand and amplify the work that's being done because there's amazing work that's happening in a lot of isolated pockets and there isn't a community of practice that brings people together so that they can learn from each other, share their ideas and expertise and experiences so that we can build on it and sort of define what good looks like and what people need to be able to support each other because as I said, it's not about the one perfect program that's going to solve this problem for all of us. There's lots of local communities acting in ways to sort of empower themselves and to tackle challenges in their own communities. So it's how do we support them to do more of that, to expand that, to improve it if needed, how, how can they learn from others in that space. And climate absolutely is one of those. The other one is actually data. We see a lot of people working with um, GIS data sets and other data sets to sort of map issues and challenges in their communities and how to support young people to then activate and, and advocate for um, solutions to those challenges. I'm curious, um, I used to teach sixth grade math and I was an after school provider as well. Uh, what, are the, what are the components, um, shout out to after school, what are the components of a good STEM program, you'd say? Like when you, when you talk about their great programs across the country in isolated pockets, what is great to you? I think a lot of it is how it brings it alive for the young people in that community, right? Because the truth is that a lot of after school providers are not STEM experts, but they are excellent at working with young people. They are youth development experts. So I think some of it is how do you use STEM as a tool for bringing about agency and confidence in young people. And, and that happens when you can really contextualize it to what's happening in that community so that STEM is seen as relevant to their lives. And, and the learning happens through that process. And I think there's very much an element of the after-school educator or the other community-based organizations, leaders, almost learning alongside the young people. And I often find that being unafraid is a key characteristic, right? To be able to say, I don't know, let's figure it out, because that's how science works. You know, we don't know the answers all the time. We're sort of trying to figure it out. So I think some of it is that, and the reality is, you know, um, there's always a need for more resources. There's a need for more partnerships. I think partnerships with other science-rich organizations in the areas help. So there's a lot of different components, and I'll go back to saying there isn't one single definition. There's a, it looks different in every community, but I think a commitment to offering that kind of programming and that sort of co-design, co-creation, co-learning are all hallmarks, I think, of that kind of work. Um, I really enjoyed your talk and your focus on context specific situations and applying knowledge in different contexts. So I'm curious um, if you could speak to how one might also apply science in different situational contexts where the best scientific answer may not be able to be played out to get the best results because of culture, nuances on the ground, a variety of different situations, politics. You know, we're told all the time it's not always about the science when decisions are having to be made. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little to that and how do we educate our up and coming STEM workforce so that we can have more impactful um, science in society without this political divisiveness, if you will. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not sure that I can exactly answer the question that you're asking. Let me try, and you can um, bring me back on track if I go off in a different <laughs> direction. Um, so, 
I mean, there are certain things, like scientific facts are scientific facts, right? But at the same time, they do intersect with culture. And I think it's, it's this issue of what is the end goal? What are we actually trying to communicate and where are we trying to get to? And I think it is that humility that we as scientists must have. And I think what Peter said earlier really resonated because I think what people are looking for is sort of validation, right? And a sense of belonging. And I think those are very human needs. And I think science is a very human endeavor. So I think it's how do we actually bring that into play and into the equation so that there is some common ground that we can then start with, so that the problem is phrased differently, framed differently. And, but, but we know where we want to go. It may not be the exact path we would have taken to get to that end point. And some of that just has to be a lot of sort of almost radically human conversations with people in that community to understand their hopes and dreams and fears about what the information you might be trying to work on with them might be, but is there a different way to approach it? Not sure that answered your question, but that's my answer. <laughs> so I have more of a comment than question, but I would say education and hope got me up here in this stage. Right. So for the communities that you're trying to impact, um, do you have a recommendation or suggestion for those who may have hope but may feel things are hopeless? Yeah, that's a tough one, right? right? And I think that some of that, right, like I work in a policy group here in Washington and we work with a lot of state level as well as city level policy makers. And, and I think a lot of this is continually looking to see how we can bring programs and resources into those communities, how we can bring mentors into those communities, how we can continue to show what is possible. And, um, and sometimes there are other needs, right, that, that need to be addressed. It's not just about science literacy. This poverty is a very real issue, right? And there's many other issues. So it's how, how do we work with the other actors who are trying to do their best to support that community to, to fit in with the larger agenda, that the agenda, recognize that the agenda just isn't about science education, it's about supporting the people in that community. And I really mean this when I say it's about supporting that community to thrive and the young people to thrive, and that goes beyond science, right? And science is a part of it, I think, in this modern day and age. I think scientific literacy is a it should be included in the definition of literacy because it's what helps us move through life. And I think, but again, it's that conversation between what does the community really need and what are you taking to the table because if you're not even, not, not only not in the same boat, but in different lakes, not gonna go anywhere very far, right? So. Anita, thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. So our final dynamic dialogue speaker is Hari Han. She is a political scientist who studies civic and political engagement and collective action. She's here to share recent insights on how miscommun mis miscommunication impacts health messaging. Miscommunication, how it impacts health messaging. Let's welcome Hari Han. Hi. Um, as a political scientist who studies democracy and social change, one of the things that I've been doing um, for the past few years is doing a lot of work with people who are fighting for racial justice within the context of evangelical megachurches in America. And a couple years ago, one of the pastors who I'd gotten to know through that work called me to ask me what I thought about vaccines. It was a couple years ago, it was in the height of the coronavirus pandemic, and he had been hearing from some of his other pastor friends that the vaccines weren't safe, and he wanted to know what I thought. Now, he and I are really different from each other. Um, I'm not evangelical. I am a social scientist, and um, I live on the East Coast. Um, he is deeply a person of faith. Um, he believes that the Bible is a better guide for understanding our world than the scientific method. Um, and he lives in what you might call America's heartland. But we had gotten to know each other through this work that we had been doing together, and he wanted to, to know what I thought. 
So I assured him that I was quite positive that the vaccines were safe and effective. You know, and he laughed and he said, well, you would know because you're a doctor at Johns Hopkins. Um, and I had to remind him I'm not that kind of a doctor. Um, which, by the way, that joke would not go over very well in a lot of audiences, but I appreciate your laughter, so thank you for that. Um, and, you know, we chatted, chatted a little bit more and he said, well, you know, can you send me some information that I can share with some of my friends? And I said, sure, I'll do that. But then once we got off the phone, I thought about what should I send him? And I wasn't sure. Um, it made me step back and think about how is it that we know what we know, right? And Elijah Milgram is a philosopher who writes about the fact that one of the characteristics of modern life is hyper-specialization. So we all go through the world and we actually don't know certain things, but we trust other people who tell us those things. Right? So I don't actually understand the biology behind how mRNA vaccines work, but I trust the scientists who do. Um, but we're so specialized that in a lot of cases, if I read a paper about the vaccines, I wouldn't even know how to d differentiate what's a legitimate expert from a not legitimate expert, right? And so what I do instead is I look for markers of trust, right? I might turn to friends and colleagues at Johns Hopkins or maybe look and see if the author is a member of the National Academy to try to figure out is this a trustworthy paper or not. And that pattern of what I was doing or what I do in my life is the same as what a lot of people do, right? Is that we find people who share our belief systems and then we ask them what they think. And that's why there's so much research that shows when you're talking to someone who believes disinformation, one of the worst things you can do is actually throw a lot of scientific information at them, right? It's much more effective to find someone who they trust, who's already part of their circle of trust, and then have them have a conversation, right? If I'm a hippie mom in Berkeley who doesn't believe in vaccines, it's much more effective to find and have another mom come and talk to me about while she vaccinates her children than it is to send her papers that prove that vaccines work. And so the challenge then in our current moment is to find those kind of trusted messengers. But that's one of the hardest things to do right now. Why is it? So our social stru the structure of our social space has changed dramatically in recent decades. Um, I think there are three changes that are relevant to um, identify here. First, a lot of us go through our lives right now having lots of social interactions but building few social relationships. Right? I might have an interaction with someone on Twitter, I might have an interaction with a barista at Starbucks, right? but we don't have a relationship, right? because what differentiates a relationship from an interaction is that both people have a shared expectation for a future. Right? Second, a lot of us go through our lives, have, those of us who have relationships, we're much more likely to have transactional relationships than social relationships. Right? The commodification of American life has meant that we have lots of transactional relationships in, with both, in which both parties are trying to protect their self-interest. Right? I have a transactional relationship with my mechanic, we have an expectation for a shared future, but we're both trying to, to protect our self-interest in that relationship. My relationship with my college roommate, on the other hand, is really different because what happens in that relationship is I give to it without knowing what I'm going to get in return, right? Those are the kind of relationships that engender trust. Third, um, the disintegration of a lot of our civic infrastructure and the balkanization of American life has meant that even when we have those social relationships, we're much more likely to have them with people who are like us. Right? And so what that means, if you put all those things together, is that you have Many, most people have fewer relationships. Among those people, they have even fewer social relationships. And then among those people, you have fewer relationships with people who are different from you, right? And so if information is social, and the way in which we find information about the complex modern world that we live in is through our social networks, then we're much more likely to live in these echo chambers in which disinformation can bounce around um, very, very frequently. So that's the bad news. Okay, so what's the good news? So as I thought about how to respond to my friend, the pastor, I thought about what are some of the lessons that I learned from the work that I've been doing with him over the past few years. He's a pastor in the third largest megachurch in America. Um, it's, a, it's a church that gets 35,000 people to show up every Sunday for services. They have 500,000 people who show up online, right? So they have, an they have a scale that's enormous. Um, but somehow, when you go to that church, it feels really intimate, right? Everyone in that community feels belonging, right? And why is that? Well, one of the mottos in the church is this idea that belonging comes before belief. Right? Think about that for a minute, right? Belonging comes before belief. In most of the social spaces that we inhabit, belief comes first. Right? Imagine if someone came here and stood up and said, I don't believe in science. Right? They would probably get a few looks, a little bit of scans, people wouldn't be sure how to react to them, right? But in my friend's church, 
you know, their attitude is, we're really clear about what we believe in, right? We believe in a Christian God, but you don't have to believe in any God. You don't have to believe in our God. No matter what you believe, you're still a part of our community. Um, and so what, we, what I'm finding is that people are looking for that kind of belonging um, all over the world. And the work that we all have to do is to do, is to take those lessons from both this church and from the work on disinformation, which is to create those relationships of belonging with people with whom we don't know and across all the different social spaces that we inhabit. Our faith institutions, our kids' schools, our neighborhoods. We all interact with other kinds of people, but we can build those relationships of trust. And some people think that, that, that doing that work might take too long in a short-term problem that we have. And I'll just stop with a sort of saying that people say, which is that the best time to have planted a tree right, is 20 years ago. Right? But the second best time to have planted a tree or to plant a tree is tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Hari. OK. Well. We don't have any questions. That was such a good <laughs> <time. laughs> uh, No, I, I think that was great. It touches on so many points that are unique, um, particularly when you're talking about church. You automatically thought about the, the presence and impact of the church in the black community. And also, when you rely on stakeholders and trusted sources in the community, you assume when you receive some information from them, it's already been vetted, and you can just hit accept, you know, mm -hmm. because it came from from, a, from a, uh, a past or someone that you recognize. Um, how do you think we can kind of combat that notion of you know, acceptance when we know that the information is not always correct, particularly for hidden communities or communities that are often marginalized? Right. Um, it's a compli complicated question. <laughs> Give me a small, small answer. Small answer, yeah. yeah. Um, so here's what I'll say is that um, I think it is absolutely true that um, you know, faith institutions, a lot of the structures that, con that um, structure our social lives are really important in helping us understand um, what is true. And it's also true that if we think about what the causes of disinformation are, one of the problems is that it's, it's profitable to spread disinformation. Right? And so you have to learn, so people have to become effective consumers of that. I think part of it is education, as Anita was talking about um, just before. But part of it also is to think about the role of, of doubt in the construction of knowledge, right? And people often think about faith and the scientific method as being polar opposites of each other. But if you actually think about it, at the center of both faith and the scientific method is the idea of doubt, right? Like, I have hypotheses. I'm not sure what the answer is, and so I ask questions without knowing what the outcome is going to be. Right? People who turn to faith communities, I think, are not sure how to make sense of the world, but then are just based on you know, faith are going to accept this kind of idea of a higher power. And so I think if we begin to think about where those commonalities are and then how we return those values um, to it, then you begin to kind of create a different set of practices. Is, it, is there anything that has surprised you in your research as you study the relationship between evangelical communities and trust or community building, especially in a moment where the, the national narrative is less people are going to church, this is the least spiritual mm -hmm. sort of generation that there's ever been, and, and you're like, well, this one is, you know, they got it going on. So yeah. has anything surprised you in the yes. research? A million things. Um, I actually like, so this is great because my, I was worried that the woman was going to come out and, make, and sing, and so I like sped through a couple of things. But um, so um, I got you. I got you. you know, I'm here for you. Didn't want you. her to sing. It would have been, been very embarrassing to be the last person, have the only person have her sing. Um, okay. So um, so it is true that um, the median church in America has fewer than a hundred people, and it's and it's getting smaller. Right? But mega churches, which are defined as a church that has 2,000 or more people, um, on average, they've experienced 34% growth over the past decade. Um, we've gotten to the point now where the largest 9% of churches in America contain 50% of the church going population. Shut up. Yep, it's heavily skewed. So that's shocking in and of itself, right? And so what does that say? Well, it tells me that it's not that people are giving up on church necessarily, right? But people are looking for communities of belonging, right? People are looking, searching for something that they're not sure where to find. And so I'll give you one more statistic on these is that the average mega church. 96% um, of its budget comes from individual donations, right? And that's just like a marker of saying how, how committed people are to contributing to these communities that speak to something that they want. 
It is also true, um, to your point though, that we also see a rise in what are called religious nuns, right? Like people who don't identify as any religion. And so both of those trends are happening um, at the same time. And um, the question is, is like, what does it mean to be a nun, right? Does it mean that um, I don't want to identify with the label of evangelical, let's say, because it's become so politicized, or does it mean that I actually don't believe um, in, in God? And we don't really know the answer to that yet. Thank you. I have a particularly not well-formed question, but um, it, it's about this concept of belonging, which I think it all resonates with all of us so strongly, right? We all want to belong somewhere. But in the climate space, belonging also is a constraining kind of um, set of beliefs, values, norms that disallow certain populations from thinking that climate has anything to do with them. And so I guess I'm wondering in your experience, um, do you see kind of conceptions of where I belong being malleable in any way, or are there moments in life or particular characteristics that allow people to shift their conception of where they belong or who they are, what their identity is in that belonging space? Yeah, um, I mean, I will say just speaking personally, um, when I first started doing this work um, with evangelical churches, I mean, as I said, I didn't grow up in a, I didn't grow up Protestant, I didn't grow up in um, an evangelical community, and I sort of, you know, kind of crept into these spaces, kind of feeling like I would be a little bit shunned, or I wasn't sure how I'd feel, and, and you know, it's like this, this, this sense of radical hospitality surrounded me, just like it surrounded everybody else, right, and um, I don't know if it shifted my identity, it certainly didn't, but, but I look forward to going to this church, right? I look forward to seeing my friends. I look forward to, to seeing people. And so I think that sometimes we underestimate the, pow the transformative power of the social relationships that we have. And part of it, I think, is because our social infrastructure is fraying. Um, but I think part of the message that I want to leave people with is this idea that when we think about combating disinformation, we have to address not only the messaging and the narratives and the ideas that are coming out, but also the social infrastructure that underlies how we hear and interact with the things that we, the information that we receive. So I was curious, how do you think, like, an actionable step, how can we be more belonging in our health messaging? I'm thinking of during COVID, the signs that were in people's front yards that said, believe in science. And I, in my mind, I'm thinking that's not affecting anyone's opinion of science <laughs> except for <laughs> reinforcing our own. Um, you know, in the church, you know, in the church community, that access for the most part is free, but in the healthcare setting, there's a huge dollar sign tied to it, whether you wanna become a scientist or a physician mm -hmm. and go to school and pay for that or go and pay for services. And so how, how do we make it more belonging? Um, it's just, you know, very inaccessible for many, uh, on many different levels and without a, how do we also make that messaging not so judgmental, if right, you will, right. Jewish people away? Um, well, first I'll just say I love the example of yard signs. Um, you know, I also do work with like political campaigns and stuff like that. And, um, and there's a lot of research that shows that yard signs aren't actually that effective in like getting someone to support a candidate or anything like that. But all, but candidate, it's like a joke among a lot of campaigners because campaigns can't run a campaign without yard signs because people get so mad if you don't have one, one to give them, right? So it's one of these things that's, it's a very expressive act, right? People want to be able to say like, I'm someone who believes this in science. It doesn't convince anybody, but it makes me feel good, right? And, um, and so I think that, you know, related to the question that you're asking is that, um, you know, a lot of the, the stickiest problems that we have when it comes to disinformation are so intertwined with structures of inequity in our society, and there's no yard sign that's going to dismantle that structure. And so, to me, that's part of the reason why we have to think not only about the messaging, but also the social infrastructure. <laughs> but in terms of something like health, how you open that space up and, and make it more equitable, I mean, I think that there's tremendous work that's going on through public health agencies, through a lot of community-based organizations. I think sometimes we underestimate the institutions that we have that already gather people towards them that become opportunities to open people, open access to governmental services, to other kinds of information, to different kinds of relationships. You know, food banks, um, public health agencies, my, my kid's pediatrician, like all of these should be opportunities for connection and belonging that right now we're not necessarily using. Hari, thank you thank so you. much.
And y'all, thank you to our provocateurs. Thank you, Leslie and Roger and DeRay and Sabrina. Thank you so much. And thank you as well to our human timer for being on standby. Thank you, Nancy. <laughs>